This conference will now be recorded. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I know we're waiting for some more folks to log in, but thank you to everyone who has already logged in. Um, good afternoon. I'm Melinda Condon of the PNA Foundation, and I thank you for joining us today for this session, 10 Steps to More Inclusive Reporting. This is the third in the PNA Foundation's special diversity series, Leading Local, the Media's Impact on Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity. Many, many thanks to the Calkins Foundation for providing a grant that made this series possible. Our first sessions earlier this spring included Respect at Work and Amplifying Diverse Voices in the Coverage and Newsroom. If you missed them, please contact us and we'd be happy to share the recordings. Our next webinar, Seeing the Whole Community, is set for August 12th. It features Val Hepner discussing how editors and reporters can better visually cover all their audiences through photos, design, art, et cetera. Please be sure to check our PMA website for more information and to register. Today, we're delighted to have Melba Newsom joining us. Melba is an award-winning independent journalist with over 20 years of experience. She is currently a fellow at the Reynolds Journalism Institute, where she completed a project on producing more inclusive reporting. She'll be sharing the results of her research with us today. And a few reminders, please note that today's session is being recorded. Feel free to put questions in the chat box, which you can find on the right side of your screen with a little bubble thing. And please mute your audio if you haven't already. It cuts down on the background noise for everyone else. So thank you again for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to Melba, make her the presenter, and hope that you all have a good session. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me today uh, to share my my fellowship project, which started out to be a, it was much more. There was a lot more interest in it than I anticipated when I started this project. When I applied for the fellowship, I think it was right. It was at the right time and it was the project for the right time. I did want to uh, correct something that Melinda said. My fellowship project was completed in February. It, it ran from June through February. So I applied for uh, this project in um, to start the 2020 year. And I think the application was due like the 1st of March. And at that time, I was just talking to a friend and I noted how sometimes the re reporting, the sources weren't diverse. And so, and so often it's because um, we may be on deadline for a variety of reasons that the, what I said was the only time black people are in stories and when it's about crime, the only time Latino or Hispanic people are in stories are when it's about immigration or something like that. And so the impetus for this was about just portraying people in the full spectrum of their lives. Like, for instance, if you're talking about home renovations, I was like, well, Black people renovate their homes. Why are we ever presented in, in just regular stories like that? And, you know, uh, Latinos also take vacations. Why can't we ever have a good travel story in that way? And a lot of times I think it's because it was just basically because we, you know, go to the sources that we know for often. And if your newsroom isn't diverse, then a lot of times your source books won't, you know, the people that you go to for sources won't be diverse either. So I'm going to put the screen down and just kind of put up my, uh, I'll start sharing my screen, but this is the, the report that came out of my project was 10 steps to more inclusive reporting and, and how to do that. A lot of the things that I found was it was just people didn't know how to go about it. And when you are reporting on deadline, it is be, you just have to go with the people you know. You go back to the same folks over and over again. And that was kind of 
the challenge. It wasn't so much that folks did not want to diversify when everybody thought that it was important. It was just how to start. And when you were just working and trying to get the story out for the day, that poses a challenge. So this was the, the uh, project and the conclusion of that. And that'll be available. Melinda can share that with you at the end, the PDF for that. But I, you know, I'll start and I'll go through this as a um, as a PowerPoint presentation. And I just want to share. Is everybody able to share? See my screen? So I'm going to do that. Okay, great. So let me try to bring up the. Hold on one second. I'm clicking on the wrong thing here. Okay, so here's my, um, let's see, let me think how much of this I have up. Okay, so, and do you, are you able to see the full screen of the PowerPoint presentation? I just have a few slides that kind of summarize what I came up with. And then about halfway through, we're going to do a brief exercise. So did everyone, if you can just like, uh, Melinda, do we have a, that show of hands feature on here where people can respond in that way? If they receive the links I sent out about the two articles we're going to discuss. Uh, no show of hands, but okay. the chat room, we do have the chat if anyone okay, wants. Okay, so you can uh, notice that, put in if you receive that and had a time, had a chance to look at that. And Melinda's going to monitor the chat room for us. But so this was the... Um, like I said, we'll start with what we what I came up with about that. So we what the challenges when I surveyed, I did this project working with three newsrooms, and one was the Charlotte Observer. I'm based in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I, I am a freelancer. And so I work with Charlotte, uh, the Charlotte Observer, the uh, WFAE, which is the NPR, the local NPR affiliate here and then uh, North Carolina Health News, which is a uh, statewide uh, nonprofit health news, um, you know, news reporting service. And so I did it, started out talking to the, the editors or the publishers, the content, the chief content providers, uh, uh, chief content officers of those people, of those publications. And what they said to me was, you know, first of all, there's two Rolodex reliant. And that's just everybody goes to the same sources that they've already started, that they've used all the time. And so, of course, if you if your sources aren't already, if you don't have a Rolodex that's diverse, you're going to not have diversity in your stories. And then it's like we say, reacting instead of reporting. You just kind of go to what the news is and you don't think about your sources in advance you just kind of hop to what you know uh, one thing someone pointed out is you may have diverse but you go to the same sources you know you have one black person that you go to all the time for your stories or or for commentary or one you know one latina woman that you go to and so we need to think about that that you know rather than acting like this person speaks for every uh person in this community so try to think broader than that and, and change it up the other thing is the the gatekeeper problem i report on health a lot so that means like calling um health organizations or hospitals and getting you know to their communications person and they will always, and I asked to speak to a spokesperson, and nine times out of 10, the first person that they will give me, uh, not a spokesperson, but an expert, but the first person that they will give me will inevitably be a white male. And you have to, if you want someone different, you have to most times say, can you give me, is there a woman? Is there a person of color in this? And you have to ask for it, and, and a lot of times, I'm on, I'm understand, you know, I understand that because I'm on deadline a lot of times, but you have to ask for it. So those are the, the things that we need to keep in mind. And those are the challenges that are often posed when we are trying to do a story and, you know, and trying to change up who we quote all the time. 
So um, then when we were talking about, when I surveyed the, the newsrooms, they talked about race and, the race and ethnicity was considered the most important factor. So um, they make it, more than 90% made it a, made diversity a top priority. So the biggest obstacle is not having a ready list. And that's what I was saying. When you're on deadline and you call somebody for a source, you know, you gotta go with who you got when you gotta get that story out in 30 minutes or, you know, a couple of hours. So that's understandable. But 85% believe that diversity is important. That's very, so that was a good place to start was that it's not like this is, there's some different thinking in the newsrooms where you have to convince people that this, that you need to do this, that diversity equals better reporting. The issue is the time and kind of, um, you know, preparing to have that, uh, to have that list, to have that group and to think about it ahead of time. So one of the things we need to do is think about rethinking expertise. So who do you think of as an expert? For instance, if you're reporting on schools or something, do you always just go to the same people who are the, you know, you go to someone who's maybe an education consultant. And sometimes we need to think, is this mom who has put, had five children go through the public school system and been very involved, would that qualify as a bit of expertise about that school system? So I think in, in ways, that's how we need to think about these things. What is lived experience, um, a kind of expertise that we too often overlook or ignore? And in doing so, do we, um, in the process, cut out certain voices? Because we think of expertise as always someone with a certain degree or pedigree. And those are people who always get quoted as if they have all the answers. And so when we're talking about, you know, your network, just try to find a different network. If you're always quoting, if, like I said, if it's about education, uh, you go to the big public school system, think about maybe the charter school network. If it's about uh, some medical issue, instead of the AMA, which is the American Medical Association, uh, what about the National Medical Association, which is the uh, the historically Black Medical Association, which was formed because uh, Black doctors weren't allowed to be a part of the National Medical, uh, the American Medical Association. So that's what I mean about different networks. Uh, then we're talking about, you know, why of source diversity. When we you know, the good thing was that the, the newsrooms already think about, already know this, and that was not an issue that the reporting partners had to overcome with their newsrooms. They were already on board with that. So when we, but we know that non-diverse coverage fails your business and it fails you as a journalist because you're missing a lot large part of your audience and we don't and if you're doing that it's not good reporting and you're leaving readers or viewers out of the equation so we want to benefit everyone and we want to have different voices in the you know in the discussion and present those and I'm and I'm not talking about some false sense of quote balance where you got to quote this side said this and this side said that you know because sometimes there there aren't two sides to every story you know but I'm just saying having different voices rather than the people you know the powerful or the prominent and everything so and so think about how you're covering people, not just if you're covering them. Like I said earlier, when I started off was, are Latinos only a cover when you're talking about 
immigration or farm labor stories, right? And so that's not that's not full coverage because people do you know do more than that. And if we're talking about covering uh you know featuring gay people, it doesn't have to be about you know something that's identified you know about their sexuality. It can be about like I said, gay people remodeling their homes or how they budget their money. I'm just saying stop making, I'm, I don't mean to lecture people, I don't mean stop, but I'm saying think about people in the full context of what they do and not just about um, the thing that you may identify with them. And I think that's very it's very empowering to all people when you see someone who maybe is maybe has a, a disability just portrayed in a story that has nothing to do with disabilities. And so how often are female business leaders or medical experts quoted if those things are irrelevant to the story? Okay. And so we need to think about diversity as a necessity, not just a nice to be, because it can expand your readership and it um, helps you become your publication or your, you know, your network or whatever become ooh, typo, sorry and remain relevant to new and changing audiences. And, and so if you have a presence in different communities, you're also more likely to get stories out of those communities and that are, that are very important and you won't get scooped or maybe not as bad, you have sources there. So if something happens, you already have a network or someone that you can call and talk to where it's not just, it does, just doesn't look like parachute journalism where you show up and you, know, you haven't built any trust in that community. Um, I think we have someone who's registered from PA Spotlight and um, in this workshop. And then one, I did a story about this media diversity for the Neiman's report. And I did interview, I think the founder, and he talked about developing trust and, and trying to get people to come to the media and how important it was to develop trust and what they had done to get, um, he knew it was a long way to go to get trust in certain communities, but, efforts that they'd made and how they were they were working out. So that was that was very important. And I think it's the right model to look at when and also the acknowledgement that it's going to take time. If this, if certain communities have been um, ignored or just written about and not written from for decades, it's not going to happen overnight that you, you know, can just uh, that you're going to have the kind of trust with those communities where they'll start uh, coming to you with stories or opening up to you when something happens. And then you're not just looking at them as a point of crisis. When you only show up when there's a crisis, when something is going on um, bad, and then you jump in, and people are maybe will say to you, well, why aren't you ever here when we're talking, when we're having the garden tour or, you know, anything like that? And, and I think that goes a long way into developing, like I said, the kind of trust and getting the kind of stories when it, when it is a hard news story, getting people to call you first. Okay. So a big, a big, big issue where people just said, I don't know where to find these people, right? If you're talking experts, um, for instance, uh, there, there are different places that curate databases of experts, like the Open Notebook. 
they have a database of, and these are for science and um, health experts. And there is a diverse sources database and it is a database of databases. So you can have, a, you know, you can find people there. Um, NPR has a source of the week data database where they keep uh, everybody who's like kind of been on the show and they list them by profession. They have their, uh, you know, their ethnicity, things like that in there, how they want to be identified, you know, what pronouns, all that kind of stuff. People of color know stuff. This is just a, a, a kind of a, a shorthand, just a small list, but there are all of these kinds of of places where you can, you know, you can find people. And Harrow, help a reporter out. That's if you want to find everyday people. It can be kind of a pain because you will get a lot of folks re responding to your query, trying to sell you stuff and trying to get you to write about things that are totally unrelated. But you can, you know, often find uh, people there if you don't mind sifting through a lot of things. So we said the database of divert sources. So right here, I want to take like a short uh, like intermission for the exercise that I sent. So I hope you all got a chance to do that. And Melinda's going to um, like you have the we had there was a story that I sent. It was on NPR. If everybody got a chance to see that, and there's also the written version. And it was about vaccine hesitancy in Tennessee in a um, community of color trying to overcome that and trying to get people, it's from a few months ago, to get vaccinated. So um, when, if I would like to, get if anybody wanted to weigh in about what they thought of that story is there a different way that they think it could be it could have been improved with different sources or anything like that that they had a come i have my own opinion but <laughs> i wanted to it was emblematic of something that i think we don't think about enough in in media it was a good story but there was something that I found happens a lot. And I think people kind of overlook. So if there's any, does anybody have any comments on that who had a chance to look at it? Do we see any, any hands, any? Linda, how would, how would anybody respond if they wanted to weigh in on that story? They, they can go to the chat or they can just unmute themselves and make a comment, whoever would work. Okay. It's like freshman English. Nobody wants to like be the fresh first way in. <laughs> okay. This, this is Chris. I'll weigh in briefly. I, I okay. honestly thought it was a pretty good story and I wouldn't criticize it too much or uh, or I wouldn't anyway but um it did feel like um some of the sources were providing like um you know personal anecdotes or like nice uh, sort of like adding color to the story of people on the ground and what their experience was mm -hmm. um, but wasn't necessarily asking um diverse experts or experts from the communities they were writing about about the big picture topic that they were writing about. Yes. And so you say your name is Chris? Yeah. Okay. Chris, you are absolutely right. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> so my issue with that story, it's a very important story. I've written a lot about vaccine hesitancy and there's been, there have been a lot of stories written about that, especially back in the in the winter when the issue was, are we going to have enough people to take this on, you know, take the vaccine to get to herd immunity, to make a difference. And, and so the 
vaccine hesitancy was really prevalent among uh, black and brown people for a variety of reasons that I think the media missed the ball on in a lot of ways. But I mean, vaccine numbers, a lot of it was hesitancy, but a lot of it was access. So that story did a good job, but I it, to me, it made an error that a lot of media makes, which is you go into a community of color and you talk about their problems, but all the experts that come that resolve their issues or talk, or address their issues are white. So that particular story, they go, you know, it was about a federally qualified health center in a in a community, and the the executive director and the the chief medical officer and everybody at that federal federal health center were white. But like around the corner, not, I mean, two miles away was the first federally qualified health center in the country. And the executive director is a black woman. And they could have gone and set the story there and gotten the same story and also had the expert be someone from the same community. And I think, to, to me, it can be a bit patronizing when you act as if all of the solutions for a community of color have to come from someone outside of that community. And I don't think a lot of people realize how um, patronizing that can be, but it happens all the time. You go and you report on, um, you know, say if you like this were in the 80s and 90s and you were reporting on on AIDS and HIV. And you acted like all of the researchers and the people working on the problem were straight. And that was not true. So I'm just saying it 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 is important, I think, to have. Um, to show that there are people from within that group who also have have a have a stake in solving those issues and you're not just portraying that particular group as being pathetic and being needing the rescue and all of that and so that was my uh, my issue with that and especially when there was another very prominent uh, federally qualified health center, you know, in the same community attached to um, Harry Medical uh, College, which was, you know, the historically black medical college and who was also doing work on trying to reduce vaccine hesitancy. So I think that was a missed opportunity. It was a good story. It talked about the issues, but that's what I mean about asking the next question, thinking a little differently in how you portray people from you know making your source your sources more diverse anybody else have well i'm going to go to the next slide and we'll come back and discuss the 60 minute story in 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 just a minute okay so let's go to the uh so we're talking about where do we find people? Um, we're gonna have to do some of this work ourselves, especially if we're reporting locally, we can kind of build our own databases. And it's really, I mentioned how we do this and we're on deadline, right? And so you got three hours to do a story to go and hunt for somebody. So that's a challenge. So let's not wait until we're, uh, on deadline, just a little bit of time, you know, a little bit at a time, try to build your own databases. So there are like area nonprofits and trade groups, churches, advocacy, and community service organizations all have, you know, they have a point of view they want, want to get across and they want it, a lot of them want media attention. So that's a good place to start uh culling folks and getting names and things that and just um getting you know like their executive director their communications department and things like that to 
start building your list when you're not on the um when it's not like i just need need somebody right away right so and a lot of people found kind of maybe became aware of this when uh kamala harris was selected as vice president that she belonged to a sorority uh, a black greek letter sorority uh, so black sorority and fraternal organizations most of them have uh, a chapter in like every major city an alumni chapter and are very involved in their uh, local communities in in all kinds of ways and so they are a great source if you want to talk about you know you're looking for a financial expert you you'll probably be able to find somebody there or somebody to talk about um you know maybe school activism or or whatever you're you're looking for i think that's a great place to start if you're talking about everyday you know like every mom kind of people <laughs> and um y you you can find them in the in the phone book and ask them or you know send a note and say look we i'm doing a story on here any of your members want to talk about uh gardening or vacationing or you know the black ski club or something like that that's a great way to do that and most people don't know but there are 32 tribal colleges and universities in the country and if you and native um, indigenous people are rarely quoted and often left out of stories but this is a good way to find experts within that community like here in north carolina we have a an indigenous college and we have like uh the it is the home for the um eastern band of cherokee indians up in the, the western part of the mountains they have big health clinic there so i try to go to them and talk to them you know try to include them in in stories that i'm doing because it just adds a little bit extra or just makes it a little different we can try to do that so historically, black colleges and universities, the places to find experts on different topics. There are some are do have our research institutions. Social media, if you you can look for letters to the editors, people always want to wax poetic about certain things. And uh, legislative testimony, people who testify before you know your state legislative board, you can find people there. If there's something a hot topic that's going on, say, in Pennsylvania. Who who testified? They have their names there in the legislative record, and you can contact them if you're looking for somebody. And if they don't know, I mean, if they don't want to talk oftentimes, they'll refer to you some somewhere to someone else. But that's a good way to find uh, everyday people. And so uh, we're talking about how you track your progress how are you doing and people so if you keep track of who you interviewed that'll let you know how you're doing sometimes we think we are making great progress uh oh i'm making a whole i'm doing much better and in, in being much more inclusive in all of my uh reporting i think there was a story about npr they they launched this thing in 2013 to find that they were they did an accounting and see how how many uh, voices of color or whatever that was report, reporting in their story, and I think they were they found out that 80 percent. I may have the percentages wrong, but I got it in some other stuff. But 80 percent of everybody on there that in their stories were were white, and they like, okay, we're gonna really button down and make a concerted effort. Five years later. Uh, they counted again, and then 85% were white. So this is what happens if you just go on your gut instead of keeping a record. So making daily or weekly um, accounting of who appears in your reporting is the best way to do that. So now I'm going to talk about the 60 minutes story. And that's kind of recent. Did anybody did ever, anybody get a chance to look at that? It was a 13-minute story. 
Anyway, that was about the failure of facial recognition software. And so, uh, Linda, do we have a few comments in the chat or is that for later? Is this anything related to what we're talking about now? No, nothing in the chat currently. Okay. No. Nope. So the 60 minutes um, series is about 14 minutes or so. And it was about the failure, the problems with fa facial recognition software, picking out Black, Hispanic, and Asian faces. And a lot of it is the algorithm, you know, the way the algorithms are written. And it's featured, they were talking about there were three uh, wrongful arrests based on facial recognition software and how and what the problem is. So this was a story, but all of the people who were misidentified were, were Black. And again, all of the experts were white. And so you might say, well, there was, um, there's probably nobody doing research on this except for them. Well, that is absolutely not true. And one of the, the women, I remember reading her story, it came, she's a researcher who was at MIT. And her story started because she came to her the part, you know, she came to her apartment and she couldn't, it was supposed to be facial re recognition and she couldn't get in because she's black and the, I can never pronounce her last name, but it's Joy and a very long um, uh, African name that starts with a B and she can't, it wouldn't recognize her. It, it would only recognize her when she put a white mask on. And so that started her, um, her research into the bias in facial recognition. And that was several years ago. And so that has really blossomed into this research thing and her becoming a recognized expert in that field. And I, like I said, I remember reading that uh, years ago. Well, she was interviewed. She said she spent like nine hours with the 60 Minutes team on that story and giving them information and all that she was completely cut out and didn't appear on camera and so another person who's been doing she's written about this and has become a noted scholar her name is ruha benjamin and she's at princeton she wasn't quoted and she wasn't featured in that story so this is what and i don't know if they actually interviewed her or not but this is what i mean about so this is a problem that impacts um, people of color. But then again, all the experts were white. And so you might say that there is nobody black, but there are two black women that I just quoted you who are very well known in this area of research. And one who was even you know, interviewed and, and gave a lot of information and who was completely cut out of that story when it aired. But um, you could, and so this impacts Asians too. So you're not gonna tell me that there aren't any uh, Asians working in this field, but that's just kind of the, the blind spot. And, and so when the brouhaha started, 60 Minutes apologized to uh, the MIT researcher, but how did that happen in the first place? How did this happen when you have a story about this problem that is, you know, prevalent among people of color and you cut out? I mean, finding a Black woman researcher in this field who's become a noted expert is kind of like, you know what I mean, a unicorn, right? And you get her and you cut her out of the story. How does that happen? So, uh, you know, this is what I'm what I'm saying about how we need to be more deliberate in our in our reporting. And I will say, too, I am not I am not immune from this. I was doing a story about how the pandemic has made an impact 
on organ donation. This was like last year when it was first started out because it shut down all of the uh, elective, any organ that, if I want to give an organ to my sister, that would be considered an elective surgery. If it, if it was a, a cadaver donation, like someone died in an accident, that's not elective. So they would go and do that, but there were fewer of them because during the lockdown, there were fewer accidents and, you know, people dying from trauma. So it had a deep impact on the numbers of transplants that were happening. So I was doing this story about that. And I looked up at the end, and this is something that was impacting a lot of people of color. And I had no expert of color in my story. So none of us are, we, I was like, oh my goodness, I gotta check this, right? Uh, I gotta check myself on this. And um, then I went looking and I, I tried to make it a point, but I also had experts of color who said no to me because they felt like, I mean, in different stories, I ha I've had that happen several times because a lot of times they feel like they're being tokenized. And um, so that's a, that's a challenge. That's another level that we uh, have to get over sometimes. And it, it's it's a little bit easier for me to get over it just because of uh, just because you know I'm a black woman, but it's still that same thing of them feeling like you're only calling me because of whatever, and so you know this this reason. So that is what I'm saying, and and what the the founder of uh, PA Spotlight said to me. There's this media distrust, and then we talk about the parachute effect how we just come in when there's a story, you know, and the burden of tokenism. Some people have said, you know, if it's, you want to speak on something that's considered uh, controversial, and today, what's not considered controversial? Everything is like controversial. Uh, you know, somebody has, uh, no matter what they do, you're going to get controversy. Some little girl playing her piano, and she posted on YouTube and you're going to get a hundred people like flaming her. Oh, you suck or whatever. So it's always some troll out there waiting to kind of diminish you or your work or whatever comment you make. So a lot of people just don't, well, why would I open myself up to that? And I like the imposter syndrome, especially among women. I've had them say to me, I don't think I'm qualified to talk on this. And I'm like, what are you, you crazy? You got like these many, like you got so many letters after your name. I can't even like <laughs> pronounce it all, but there's this, that there can be that if they are not used to being asked to, you know, for a quote and they will refer to you to somebody else. And I'm like, well, they always get quoted. I don't want them. That's why I'm calling you. I looked at your, you know, your credentials are every bit as X, Y, or Z as, somebody else and and that person did not start start out getting quoted in the new york times you know everybody's got to start that somewhere so those are some of the issues of what why people will say they don't feel like they don't feel qualified and and i think you know if we want to have more diversity of voices and not just quote the same people over again we have to uh develop a, a way to get around that, like have your responses ready when they say that. Don't wait until the last moment, start to build your relationships with people before time. And don't just, you know, if you can avoid it, you know, try not to do the parachute thing because they're like, where are you the rest of the time, right? Okay, so that's what we mean about lay the groundwork. And that, that, and Melba, there's actually a question in relationship okay. to that. Um, yeah. When you were mentioning the tokenism, um, do you have any advice on, and you're kind of talking about that now, I think, mm -hmm. advice on how to approach sources and stories to mitigate or address their concerns about tokenism? Well, I, you know, one of the things that we we're talking about is don't just, if I'm talking about how often do we quote an expert who is Black when it's not about 
subjects that's just about black people is what I'm talking. So that's what I'm saying. They may feel tokenized. If the only time you call this person who is black is when you're writing about sickle cell, then you can say that's tokenized. But if you've talked to them also about, you know, issues of um, just in general, you're talking about lung cancer or breast cancer or whatever, and you refer to them in general and you show them, look, this is my reporting and this is not a story where you being kind of pigeonholed as this quote black expert or this Latina expert, but just as a subject matter expert. That's kind of one thing you do. But that's when we're talking about uh, laying the groundwork for that and why I've been trying to express how important it is to put in a little time when you're just not at the last minute calling them and saying, um, I, you know, I need some, I need a quote in an hour. Because if you haven't built that relationship or that trust, it's, it's going to be a little harder, especially if somebody's skeptical of it. Another thing that you can do if you have work that you can share with that person to say, this is the kinds of stories that I've written in the past. And so you can see some of my work that can go a long way toward, you know, building trust. But a lot of it, we talk about cultural competence as, as well. And that comes from just not from having, from being in that community when it's just not about some crisis that's happening and reporting from a community, not just about it all the time, like it's a spectacle. You know, we sometimes report on communities in crisis, but that's not all these communities are. You know what I mean? We, we need to portray like the full spectrum of life in that in that way and i think that like i said goes a long way toward doing that so those are my um you know so that's my presentation and we've got like about 10 minutes for q a or you know or just anybody input i'd love to hear you know your experiences your war stories or anything else <laughs> There was actually another question uh, in the mm -hmm. chat. Uh, when keeping track of sources and how many diverse voices we have, do you think we should also keep track of people who appear in photos? I think so. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, we just put a person in a photo and we don't really quote them. But then later on, you look back and you see that photo and you said, oh, this person can be a good source for this story or whatever. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Uh, this is Zach Kaiser up in Winona, Minnesota. Um, ah. Hi. Um, it seems like sort of when you're uh, looking to increase representation, you're facing a bit of a vicious cycle because when you first um, try to approach uh, someone of color, they might say, oh, well, you, you just want me as a token. But then you can't um, use uh, people of color as experts consistently until you develop that rapport. So you can't, there's, there's, a, there's like a chicken and the egg type thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, like I say, it's about, I think the, the issue is kind of just, it's the cultivating thing rather than if you're, if you're calling somebody and you're saying, well, I'm doing a story about gardening or whatever. And you're one of the, you know, the people and, and this story's got all kinds of folks in it. Then I think people are less likely to feel kind of tokenized. And then you, if they see you around, they see your byline on all kinds of stories, then they don't necessarily think that you are a pigeonhole writer or you know you're the kind of writer that just kinds of stereotypes you know the people i think it's it starts like like that but 
it, it is a it is a process. It's not easy. But there are also folks who love being in the media. So sometimes you have to start. <laughs> you know, you go on social media. Some folks just love the attention. So you know, sometimes you have to start with them. And I got another quick follow up. Um, sure. Now let's say we're talking. Our beat focuses on government. Um, how sorry. do we? Oh, uh, let's say our beat focuses on government. So mm -hmm. like city council or whatnot right and um, people we're talking to are government officials um how do we sort of overcome the reluctance of them um i can imagine a government official saying oh i don't want to make this a race thing um uh because they're working for a government organization they're not supposed to get into necessarily um those sorts of issues um how do i um reach that interview subject to make them feel more comfortable? You know, I don't feel, maybe I'm wrong about this, but, you know, I really don't feel that they have a choice in, in a way because that's their job and that is their, so if they don't like it, that's just too, that falls in the category is too effing bad. You know, I'm having, right now, I'm having a challenge with someone i'm reporting on like the um reparations thing up in Asheville, which is supposed to be this positive story but it's quite a mess and nobody you know that none of the local officials want to talk to me because it's quite a mess but it falls under the category of too bad you know this is your job you'll either talk to me or i'm gonna write stuff that you don't like and you have a ch I'm, I'm gonna write this story regardless okay so you can either weigh in with what you have to say or it's gonna be or not be and, and so that's a different thing because that is an obligation and your job is to hold these people accountable so i don't feel we have to tippy toe around with them and like placate their feelings and promise them a story a certain way this is the story this is what it's going to be and and sometimes them not commenting is as much of the story as you understand what i'm saying so yeah. that carries a lot of weight like the mayor said they said the mayor the mayor said she's not available i said is she not available or is she refusing to talk to me he said well she said she's not available i said okay that says a lot but and that's how I will report it. But it's not going to keep me from uh, reporting the story because this, they work for us. And, and you know, we, our job is to report the fact. But these, the, the regular people that we talk to, they have no obligation to talk to the media. So I think we do have to approach them in a different way. It is not their job. but what a government official does it you know if they don't want to say that's fine i can get the public record now and then the record will speak for itself i i don't believe in like molly coddling them or anything like that and sometimes when they don't talk that's a that makes a better story to me yeah thank you sorry there, there is another question for you Melba. Mm -hmm. um, from Emily Reddy. Um, we track diversity. We have reporters in a race, age range, sex, et cetera, using what they know and taking a best guess if they don't know. Would you recommend asking instead? And how do you do it? Yeah, I you know, I, I write a lot for North Carolina Health News, and we we're supposed to ask everybody that we interview. So yeah, I, I would recommend asking. Some people don't want to disclose but um and other people have no problem with disclosing so yeah ask if they don't tell you you know yes hey, Melba. go ahead paula okay this is a follow-up question do you say um hey person who i'm interviewing our publication has a policy of asking this? I mean, does that make it less weird? 
Um, well, I just say, hey, we, we try to collect demographic information on everybody we talk to and include in our, story, in our story. So would you mind sharing, you know, how do you qualify, blah, 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 you know, your gender, um, race and ethnicity, age, blah, blah, blah. Some folks will, and, and I have had very few people push back on that. They don't really mind. You know, just about everything that we apply for, you know, we go on. What do they do? They ask for that, right? <laughs> they ask for that information. And there's always this um, decline to say. One of the things that happened here in North Carolina, which helped really close the gap in terms of, uh, you know, the racial and ethnic gaps in terms of vaccination was they collected uh, demographic data on everybody. And that really helped uh, close who was getting the vaccinations. Like for instance, if before they would send vaccines to a particular county, if that county's population was say 30% Hispanic, they had to show that 30% of the people who got the vaccinations were Hispanic. And so that kind of stuff was really, you know, was really helpful. And people were saying, well, we're going to get pushed back and people don't want to disclose. They didn't get pushed back from that. Sometimes people are afraid because you think you might, but a lot of times folks don't have a problem. And if they do, you know, it's, it's not, I don't think often it's enough to, it's still worth asking the question. A great comment from Sam uh, in the chat room uh, about sharing another tracking method um, that has been used in the news and that she worked in before. Um, they had a map of the city with recent stories physically labeled where they were centered to see what neighborhoods were going undercovered and um, it helped visually see the coverage gaps. So that's another idea, but thank you, Sam, for sharing. Yep, they did something like that at the observer they use like uh data mapping and they were able to see the vaccine distribution what zip codes it went to and all that so that information is very helpful uh in a lot of in a lot of ways it's good to have and, and zach was asking if anyone had a written copy of the demographic questions that they asked after each interview uh well I think they they have we have the ones that we ask uh, for North Carolina Health News, and I can you know I can share that. But it's you know make up whatever you want to ask, whatever your newsroom thinks is important. I just one minute before one, but oh, here's one more question. Um, do you set diversity percentage goals to reporting? Uh, we're a very white area, so reflecting our audience would not be a good goal. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we don't, I, different publications said, said different things, but I think it's just a, a good goal to like, just try to, think about sometimes reflecting your area right if if that's the case yeah well we're at one o'clock if if we have any more questions we'll take the time and, and i'll ask Melba to answer them or um we'll give you a few more seconds to consider any more questions um if not we were happy to have all of you today and we Certainly appreciate Melba's time and her expertise. I don't have any <laughs> expertise, but I have plenty of time, plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great session. Uh, we will share the recording then with everyone, uh, as well as the folks that had pre-registered who can join us today. But thank you for all of you joining us. Um, and, um, well, thank you all. I, I really uh, appreciate you attending and um, I hope you uh, get something out of it and go forth and report. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Melba. Melba. Yeah. Bye bye. Yep. Yeah. Everybody take care and be sure to sign up for our next session on August 12th. We'll continue the series. Yep. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks again, Melba.